Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another uh, Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants uh, Google Hangout event. My name is Joe Grabowski. I will be your host for today. For those who don't know, we're celebrating space exploration this week. So throughout this week, we're going to speak to over 30 uh, people in the space industry, from astronauts to uh, National Geographic explorers to scientists and engineers in private industry, NASA, and more. So I'm very excited today to be joined by classrooms from different spots in North America, but also to be joined by our guest, Nicole Colon. She's a research astrophysicist at NASA's uh, Goddard Space Flight Center, where she leads projects on the search for planets outside of our solar system. She's worked on Kepler mission, as well as being a member of the Hubble Space Telescope Project Science Team. She grew up in New Jersey, and in addition to astronomy, loves watching football, playing computer games, and reading. So Nicole, it's great to have you joining us during Space Week today. Thanks. It's uh, really great to be here. Um, thank you for the opportunity. I'm really excited to talk to uh, so many students today. I see, you know, in the in the little webcam here. Hi. <laughs> so I'm in Greenbelt, Maryland. Um, it's kind of near Washington, D.C. And yeah, as Joe said, so I've been working um, at NASA uh, at this specific NASA facility since February. Um, previously, I was at a different center, NASA Ames Research Center, which is in California. So I jumped from coast to coast, but stayed with the NASA system. And that's because with NASA, I get to work on a lot of exciting space missions. And um, to give you a little bit of my background first, and uh, I'll do that, and then I wanted to show you guys some graphics. Um, so I knew around the age of 12 that I actually wanted to be an astronomer. So I knew I saw a movie that really changed my life. It was called Contact, um, which is based on a book by Carl Sagan. It came out in about 1997, so probably before you all were born. <laughs> but it's, um, it's a really exciting movie because it's about making contact with aliens, basically. And that really inspired me to think about you know, the search for life and the search for other planets that are not around our sun. So thinking, you know, way outside the box here, literally. Um, and that really excited me. So I ended up getting a couple uh, degrees in, in physics and astronomy. And then um, before I knew it, I was working at NASA. <clears throat> and so what I do, um, I guess, actually, I think I'm just going to jump into showing the slides now, because that's the easiest way to describe what I do. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. And then I'll have a little PowerPoint here. And let's see, hopefully this will work. So can you see yourself, Joe? Uh, not yet. Did oh, you pick the okay. option for the whole screen? Oh, I got it now. OK. Perfect. OK. There we go. I see me now. All right. So I'm going to open up this. And then do you see a big picture of a, what looks like an eclipse? We're good to go. All right. So I can't see the classrooms any longer, but I can, so I can just see my screen here. Um, but uh, probably maybe a lot of you heard of something called a solar eclipse this summer, I'm guessing. <laughs> so that's what this picture is illustrating. Um, it's, it's illustrating when the moon went um, in front of the sun and it blocked the starlight from our point of view. And in that case, the moon basically um, acted to block all the light and we call that an eclipse and you know this is very similar to what we do in astronomy when we search for planets around other stars because instead of seeing the moon block the Sun we're actually looking for other planets to block light from their stars and so it's the same as that concept as, as the solar eclipse that happened earlier this year and instead, we just use the term um, transit. So that's uh, what we call the type of uh, work I do, is we look for these um, planetary transits. So um, if you can see this movie, what you're basically seeing is a little image of a small planet blocking light from the star. Again, exactly just like how the moon blocked the sun um, in, back in August. And when that happens, if you're just kind of looking at the starlight and you, you see it, you measure it has some brightness, you know, it's, it's going to change its brightness when this little bit of light is blocked by the planet. And so that's exactly what, um, what we do in terms of uh, the Kepler mission that uh, Joe mentioned before. 
So Kepler basically looked at hundreds of thousands of stars to find these types of planets that block the light from their star. And um, there's just a little image of a spacecraft here. That's um, the Kepler Kepler spacecraft um, over here and on the bottom uh, left. And then um, just a, kind of an image in the upper right of the footprint of, um, of the telescope that's uh, in space that is looking at one part of the sky. And the long story short is that it looked for four years at one part of the sky and it found a lot of planets. So it basically told us that planets are very common because it was looking in just one part of the sky. And if you can see this, um, now we have what's called a histogram here. And all you're really seeing is the effect that Kepler had on the discovery of planets around other stars. So basically the bottom um, uh, X horizontal axis here shows the year a planet was discovered outside our solar system. So thinking way beyond Neptune and Pluto, right? In terms of distance. So this shows that around uh, 1989, 1990, we were just barely starting to find planets around other stars. So this was, you know, even back when I was young. <laughs> so I was, I was born before we knew any planets existed around other stars. Um, but now, if you go all the way to the current present day in 2017, you'll see that there's this huge jump, um, this huge bar right here that tells us, A, that we have a lot more of the uh, planets that we know about. Um, and you know, the, the different colors, don't worry about them. Um, they're telling you all the different ways we can find planets and how many have been found by the different methods. But the, the point here is looking at the bright green bar. So that's the ones that Kepler found uh, mostly. And so you can see how big that green bar is compared to everything else. And in the present day, um, this year, as of, um, you can see in the upper right, it says as of literally, you know, last week, um, November 2nd, we know of over 3,500 extrasolar planets, which is the, these planets around other stars, that's what we call them, extrasolar planets. And that's, you know, phenomenal that um, 30 years ago we knew of none, <laughs> and now we know of 3,500. And so you say, okay, well, so Kepler is responsible for a big chunk of, this, um, of these planets that, that have been found. And so you say, well, you know, okay, we found a lot, but what do they look like, really? Um, how do we, what can we tell about them? And again, the main thing that we can learn from using the transit technique when we see that planet blocks some light from the star, we're actually able to tell the size of the planet um, from that ratio. And so with Kepler, for example, you can imagine all the way um, on the left here, there's a tiny little dot that's supposed to represent the size of Earth, our own planet. But then if you go larger and larger um, up to Jupiter, which is 10, 11 times the size of Earth, um, you see that these different bars are representing how many planets Kepler found in these different size ranges. And so ultimately you have um, a lot of planets that are around the size of Earth, but then you have even more that are up to maybe two times the size of Earth. And then the tallest bar here is this gold bar, which are planets that are between two and six times the size of Earth, which is about the same size as Neptune in our solar system. And there's just so many of these, over almost 1,600 of these um, really kind of intermediary size planets. So kind of, you know, not small like Earth, but not huge like Jupiter. And so Kepler told us, yeah, planets are very common, but also planets in this size range are very common. So that was actually really surprising. Um, so, you know, in, in our solar system, we have an Earth and a Venus, which are about the same size. And then we have Mars and Mercury, which are smaller than Earth and Venus. So we have four pretty small planets. And then we have Jupiter and Saturn, which are very large and fall into this kind of small bin that Kepler found. And then you have the um, large 
Neptune size or medium size um, planets in between. And, you know, we have kind of two of those in our solar system with Neptune and Uranus. So, like, we have a little bit of everything in our solar system, but we really had no idea that planets like the size of Neptune were that common. So, Kepler's, you know, told us so many things. Um, so, you might say, okay, well, what's next, right? So, the thing about Kepler is, remember, it just looked at one part of the sky, one little tiny part. Like if you put your hand up on the sky, that's about the, the footprint that Kepler saw. Just one little part. Hundreds of thousands of stars in that part, but still one part. So now Goddard, um, where I work today, um, they are launching a new telescope called TESS. So that's launching next year, 2018. And that is TESS um, stands for the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. So it's um, there's a little kind of illustration of it here and it's going to find planets the same way as Kepler did but instead if you can imagine the whole sky is a sphere um, you're going to see basically Tess is going to look all over the sky so all the colored parts are where Tess is going to look and Kepler again just looked at like a fraction of that space so um, this this diagram is kind of busy but the point is that all the different colored regions are where Tess is looking. So if you imagine, almost like the whole sphere of the sky is going to be colored in. And Tess is going to find that, um, look for planets around all these stars. And the main thing, let's see if this movie works, um, the main thing that, that um, Tess is going to find is if you're looking at where Earth is right in the middle where the X is, um, as you zoom out, farther and farther from the Earth, you're going to see all the orange dots are what planets we think Tess will find. And then as you zoom further out, you'll see a large cone of blue where that's um, the region where Kepler found planets. And so the point is, I'll play this again, the point is that Tess is going to look for a lot of planets that are very relatively close to Earth, all those orange dots. And then this is going to be great because a lot of these planets um, have bright stars that they orbit around and um, they're relatively nearby. So the point is that they're, they're easier to study compared to the large, large cone um, of kind of like far away planets that Kepler found. So all the planets that Tess is going to find will be able to measure lots of different properties, both of um, their mass and radius, but also looking at their atmospheres. So there's a lot of great things we can do with planets from TESS. And so that'll launch next year, so we're really excited about that. And um, ultimately, uh, we want to, you know, have, this is just an artist's impression, but we want to have a whole collection of, of new planets to study um, of all different kinds, you know, small to large, um, and ones that orbit close to their star and far away from their star. And so, um, I'm going to stop sharing now so you can see me again, hopefully. Let's see. So um, what you're going to find with TESS, again, is thousands of new planets nearby. And really what I can do is I use a bunch of different telescopes to um, look for or kind of like to help with the discovery space of these planets and help confirm them and help um, measure their radii and measure their masses and measure their atmosphere properties. So ultimately, um, yeah, that's basically what I do um, is I'm looking, I work on these missions, but also I use a lot of different telescopes in the process to help support these missions as well. And so I often go to um, telescopes that are on Earth here, you know, not in space, like Kepler and TESS are both in space, far away. Um, they're both um, uh, orbiting basically farther than um, the Hubble Space Telescope, for example, which orbits kind of close to Earth. And, um, but I use telescopes, for example, at really high remote mountaintops as well, like Arizona and um, in Hawaii and places where um, we can kind of get above the clouds. And then we can measure 
um, additional properties of these planets that Kepler and Tess find in the first place. So, yeah, so that's basically what I wanted to say. Um, I don't know, I'm happy to start a Q&A now, um, and I can go back and show more graphics, um, and go back to any of the graphics if you like as well. So. All right, well yeah. thanks for sharing, Nicole. I am. Um... It's incredible that we've gone over the last few years. We know of over 3,500 exoplanets, so planets outside of our solar system. That's absolutely amazing, and it's only going to get bigger. Yeah. Like, what would you guess? In a, what would your guess be a year from now? How many exoplanets we'll know of? Oh gosh. Um, well, so I think we'll probably still be around like less than 4,000 um, since Tess is Tess right now is. Scheduled to launch in 2018, it should be um, anywhere between March and June, but it takes time. When a telescope first launches, you have to basically like do a bunch of testing with it and make sure everything's working okay um, before you do all the science. And so it'll be um, a little bit of time before we get results from tests. So probably, you know, once we get to 2019, that'll be, I think, when there'll be a huge boom, um, kind of like with Kepler, after it launched, there was a jump in like thousands of planets. <laughs> and with TESS, it's probably gonna be just as large a jump. So we could even easily double the known known planets that um, that we have right now, once we get data from them. Awesome, so you use the telescopes and you're looking at more um, kind of measurement characteristics of the planets, so their size mm -hmm. and mass and such. Mm -hmm. And then do you ever kind of look at their composition or is that another members of the team? Yeah, so um, I do some of that. Uh, so there's kind of um, certain things we look for. One, one big thing that we look for in the composition of a planet is actually water. But oftentimes these aren't planets that could be ones that could support life. So they're these really large like Jupiter sized planets, but then they orbit super close to their star. So they're just way too hot to, to have life in any form as we know it. Um, but they're still predicted to have a lot of water in, in their atmosphere, like clouds and things like that. And so that's something that um, I do a little bit of as well. So with uh, the Hubble Space Telescope, which is, um, I didn't show in any of the graphics um, I mentioned previously, I work on that at Goddard too. That has been operating um, for almost 30 years and it's doing wonderfully and it's because it's in space we're able to get above our own clouds you know on earth and we're able to get above our our own atmosphere and look at these planets and um really get like fine-tuned measurements of of the atmospheres by looking at um, different wavelengths of light so we can look in optical versus like the infrared you know when you see like your heat signature um, you can do all kinds of measurements with Hubble, and that can tell us actually about whether or not there's water in some of these planets. All right, well, let's meet some classrooms and let's start grabbing some questions. So we're gonna go to Mrs. Kremnitzer in Frederick in the United States, and she's got a grade eight classroom. Let me turn your microphone on. All right, good morning, everyone. Your microphone's on. Hello. Uh, yeah, we do have a question for you. Okay. Um, so when you were talking about finding these other planets and the, um, what was the name of it again? Like the spacecraft went and saw it. What do you plan, what do you like plan on doing with these planets, which once you find them, like, you know how they send like rovers on Mars? What are you, are you going to do the same thing? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, the question was if we're gonna send rovers to any of these new planets we find, because we're finding thousands and a lot of them are really interesting for different reasons. Um, so it's really, really um, difficult to send uh, anything to another planet, um, even when it's relatively nearby like Mars and, and even the moon. Um, but I think looking forward to uh, what tests we'll find, so um, backing up for a second, Kepler basically was launched to tell us how common are planets. And then Kepler said, yes, planets are common. <laughs> so now we know they're common. Okay, so now let's launch tests and look at the whole sky and look 
for planets basically around the closest stars to us. Um, and so when we find planets around these closest stars, that makes it, you know, not impossible to think that one day we can go there. Um, they're still very far away, like at least four years if you're traveling at the speed of light. <laughs> so it's, you know, there's a lot of uh, technology we need to develop, but it makes it more and more feasible um, finding these planets uh, from a mission like TESS. And so ultimately we'd love to send something like a probe, you know, to other planets and it might take you know, decades from now, uh, maybe a hundred years or more, but maybe, maybe in your, in your lifetime, um, it could happen. Yeah. That's kind of everyone's end goal. <laughs> All right. Great question. And that brings up a really good point that now is a really good time to start thinking about getting into the space industry because there's so much left to explore and discover and so many incredible careers. So that's definitely something you should start thinking about if you really like science and space. Um, let's meet our next classroom. So we have a group in Henrico, Virginia with um, Mrs. Adams and Mrs. Cruz and they are a grade four classroom and your microphone is on. When, when did you first want to do your do job? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I, I knew um, I wanted to study astronomy around the age of 12. Um, I mentioned before that I was influenced by a movie that kind of inspired me to to look for aliens. <laughs> um, but it took, you know, a long time to obviously go to college. It takes many years of school. Um, so after high school, I was in school for another nine years um, in order to get my, my um, education up to where I needed to be, uh, to be an astronomer. But um, I kind of, I kind of knew the route I wanted to take around the age of 12, but I hadn't fully decided on, on a path to NASA, um, probably until uh, I was kind of finishing up in graduate school. And I was thinking about what I wanted to do in the long run. And I was like, you know, actually, it's not impossible to work at NASA. So <laughs> I kind of geared myself towards that. Um, so it was, you know, a lot of education, a lot of schooling, a lot of science and math classes and everything. Um, but, you know, I got there eventually. So it's definitely not impossible. <laughs> so probably a lot of students are thinking, oh, no, nine years after I, I finished high school. But when it's something you love and you're passionate about, it's probably not that difficult. You probably are pretty excited and having a lot of fun while you're doing it as well. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, let's meet Mr. Pennington's class. So um, Mr. Pennington's class is joining us uh, from Denton uh, in the U.S. It's a grade 8 classroom from Lockerman Middle. And your microphone is on. Wow, thank you, Dr. Cole. We have one question for you. Um, will our regular people going to be able to use the TESS telescope, or is it just for NASA? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, actually, so I did not mention this. Um, so the TESS data that'll come down, it's actually going to be publicly available. Um, so I'll see it at the same exact time that you all could see it. Um, it's going to be hosted at a website um, that is run by the Space Telescope Science Institute, which is in Baltimore, Maryland. And they basically host um, a data archive for a bunch of different space telescopes like TESS. And so yeah, the, the cool thing is that everyone can see the data at the same time. And there's going to be all these measurements of stars that you can look through um, yourself. And you can say, like anyone can look for planets. There's um, there's something right now, some of you might have heard of, called Planet Hunters, that is um, part of this Zooniverse world where it's basically like a crowdsource way to look through a bunch of these different uh, measurements from the Kepler spacecraft to help find planets. And um, that's, a, as far as I know, someone is going to try to do that same thing with tests, but you can always look at the data um, exactly at the same time as I can. And you could 
easily find a planet before I do. <laughs> you know, um, it, that's the great thing about about this mission is that everything is going to be um, public. So it's kind of like everyone's telescope in a way. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's a great question and, and such a good point you bring up, Nicole, that we really do live in an exciting time with citizen science. Mm -hmm. If you go online and search for citizen science projects or Zooniverse, like you did mention, mm -hmm. um, you can take part in marine biology studies, um, all kinds of, of online research you can read and, and results. You can help the scientists actually do uh, some of the research. So we really are living in an incredible time in these amazing you know, multi-million and billion dollar machines, you can access the information in real time. It's pretty incredible. Mm -hmm. Definitely not something we could do, say, five even, or even five years ago, 10 years ago. Yeah, it's great. Well, let's meet our next classroom. So um, this time, joining us is Mrs. Gibson's class uh, in Grafton. They're in Canada. They're a grade six classroom, so they're studying space this year. And they have an inquiry unit on the multiverse going right now. So how's everyone doing this morning? Good. All right, go ahead. Um, so I have one question. It's have you guys have found any plants that are capable of having human life other than Earth? So I think I heard the question. It was about um, whether any planets that we know of are capable of having life outside of Earth. Is that right? So yeah, that's another great question. Um, these are all great questions. <laughs> so the the cool thing about all the planets that we find is that um, we can measure certain properties. So yeah, we can measure their size and their mass oftentimes, um, but we can also measure their temperature by knowing um, basically how far away they, they orbit from their star. So just like the Earth orbits, you know, just far enough away that it's only heated so much that, um, it's able to basically have liquid water on its surface and we're not like too hot, you know, to that all the water boils off, but we're not too cold that everything's frozen. And so uh, when we measure the temperature of all these planets, um, we find some that um, I want to say maybe dozens that fall into this temperature range where they are similar enough to Earth's temperature that they could have water. Um, and so some of these planets are the first targets for um, future advanced telescopes to look at to, to try to measure their atmospheres and look for some signatures um, that, you know, could maybe even be in, indicative of like plant life, if not um, like uh, maybe other types of life, you know, not humans because they wouldn't be humans really, <laughs> but, you know, any type of biology. Um, that, that we're going to try really hard to look at some of these planets. Um, and so Kepler's found dozens of these already. And TESS is going to also try to find them. We're expecting a lot of these undiscoveries from TESS. And so, you know, kind of in that case, time will tell about uh, whether or not we can measure any kind of properties that, that are a pretty good signpost that there's, you know, a potential life, whether it's... Um, plant life or or different kinds of um, biology. So we're getting there, but it'll probably take uh, another several years, maybe, you know, within the next decade, we could have a good measurement, I would say. All right, so we're constantly looking for planets in that Goldilocks zone, not too hot, not too cold. That's right. <laughs> um, let's visit our last classroom who's joining us live on camera today. And actually, I should say, we do have viewers who are watching on YouTube, so if you do have any questions or the YouTube live chat, uh, let us know who you are and where you're from, and we'll try and squeeze one in before the end of the Hangout. But um, uh, let's visit our last classroom first. So um, we have Mrs. White's group, grade six is in Barrie, Ontario, Canada. So they're studying space this year as well. Uh, go ahead with your question. Um, did you work or plan, um, like, did you help plan the, um, the test? Did you help plan Tess? Right, got it. <laughs> yeah, that, so that's something that um, that's really cool about working at NASA is that you can work um, to help plan different missions like Tess. Um, so Tess was basically already pretty well developed by the time I joined NASA. Um, 
but I have helped out now that we're getting closer to launch, you know, things are kind of getting real, <laughs> you know, it, it, this whole time we've been planning, um, people have been planning the whole mission and thinking about what's to come. But now it's like, okay, we're actually going to launch this thing soon, you know, so what next? Like, are we ready for this, all this data we're going to get? And so I've been starting to help out with that process. Um, and, you know, in the future, though, beyond that, we're already thinking about what other telescopes we might want to launch in the future. And so uh, some people at NASA are starting to think about that. And um, I'm, you know, helping out in little bits and pieces of, well, what kind of telescope might we need to do this or to find this type of planet or study that type of planet. So that's the cool thing, again, about NASA. You can work on a bunch of different missions at once, um, some that are you know, decades from launching <laughs> even, but there's a lot you can, you can do. So, yeah. All right. Well, we've met all the classrooms and they've had a chance to ask some questions, but Nicole, if you have another couple minutes, uh, we can open it up and see if there's a couple more questions from the classes. Sure. Awesome. So, Boys and girls, if you do have another question, we'll try and get maybe one or two more in. Um, just come up to the camera and wave right at the camera so we can see um, that you do have another question. Yeah, there's one we'll, or a couple. Yeah. Can you see they're frozen on mine? Oh, um, really? Let me, just, uh, let me make them big and I'll see who's waving. And uh, it looks like Mr. Pennington's class. There we go. Your mic's on. Do you think maybe you would try to go to Mars in the next three years? In the next four years, even though you have lots of work to do on NASA? <laughs> um, so, yeah, that, you know, I think someone could plausibly go to Mars. I personally, I'm happy staying on Earth. <laughs> so I'm perfectly happy, you know, using telescopes here and, and helping out astronauts if I can. Um, but, you know, it also depends. Last I heard with the astronaut program, um, there was a height requirement and I wasn't tall enough. <laughs> so, you know, there's also that. So who knows? I mean, it's, it's, I think it'd be fun, um, but I'm not ready to, to leave Earth. So I'm happy to watch other people do it and support them any way I can. Fair enough. It's a big commitment to go to Mars right now since we're not even sure we have a way back yet. Yeah. <laughs> Although my brother, my brother is interested, I think. <laughs> yeah. All right. I think I see someone in uh, Mrs. White's class again, waving like crazy. So if you guys have a question, go ahead. Um, you may have already uh, answered my question, but have you ever been to space? And if you haven't, would you like to go? Yeah, so I have not been to space, um, and, you know, often astronauts are very, it's funny, I mean, some of them are scientists, but in different ways. Um, a lot of them have military training, so they're like pilots and all these things, and I'm basically just a pure scientist, so um, I haven't, you know, looked into going into space, um, but I, you know, I'm happy uh, to support anyone who wants to go. And I think it's very exciting when they do go. Um, so maybe one day in the far distant future. <laughs> but for now, I'm, I'm going to stay here um, right in Maryland. <laughs> Still a little frozen on the bottom of my screen, but yeah, I'll look for someone waving Deborah, by clicking one by one. Oh, I see them. That's some good waving from Mrs. Kravitz's yeah. group. You guys are on. OK. Hello. Um, do you, um, I have two questions. One, do you really believe that there's like aliens and life in space? Oh, yes, yeah, so I can answer that first if you want. So, okay. so yeah, so there was, um, there was a slide I was thinking about showing in my, in my little presentation before, but, um, I didn't, but I was going to make the point that you know, all these planets we found, there are around some thousands of stars, but our galaxy has billions of stars. And then our galaxy, the Milky Way, is one of billions of galaxies. So I think sheer numbers alone tells us that there's billions and billions and trillions of planets out there. 
So there's got to be at least one, you know, other one that has life. Um, it's probably nothing like what we see on Earth. Um, and I don't know if we'll find any, you know, evidence in my lifetime. But I think based on sheer numbers, there has to be some other kind of life out there. The microphone's off. Okay. okay. Um, my second question is, once you find out all of these planets, what are you going to do with that information? What's the next step? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, right. So we find all these, all these planets, and now we know they're common, right? So we know they're everywhere. And so now we can, again, find the ones closest to us, because really, it's, it's about knowing um, kind of like, the different populations of planets, like the more planets we find and the different sizes and masses, we can get a better understanding of how they all formed. And then if you know how they formed, then we can kind of extrapolate from that and say, well, if they all formed this way, then what is the likelihood that they have life? You know, things like that. Um, so we can do like models and simulations and things like that to understand um, their formation. And the more planets we, we know of um, in general, we can find the best ones to look at their atmospheres. And so whatever um, has a really bright star that it orbits around or the ones that are, you know, the right temperature. Um, so we kind of have to look for all these planets just to find a few really good ones <laughs> in a way. Um, but yeah, so there's, it's all about in the end, like looking for uh, a, looking for planets where we can measure their atmospheres and looking for potential signs of, of, you know, habitation or habitability, like if there's liquid water. And so that's kind of like the long, you know, the end goal. And if we get there one day, you know, I'm not sure what, what's next after that. I mean, we'll probably, we'll want to go there <laughs> really. I mean, that's the end goal. We want to explore the universe. That's, that's, um, I think, why we all join NASA, in a sense, just to explore. Yeah. So those are two great questions, and mm -hmm. I 100, I'm 100% with you on the first one. And, I mean, there's billions of stars in our galaxy. There's billions of other galaxies, which will have billions of other stars, and each of them, there's got to be life on other planets. There's just mm -hmm. too many planets for there not to be. Yeah. <laughs> all right, and since we did visit each class, we'll give... Um, We'll just pop into Mrs. Gibson's class just to check and see if they have a wrap-up question for us. All right, so go up, go up, right? Yeah. Okay. Oh, I see someone coming up. Thank you. That's positive. Hello. Hi. Um, <laughs> my question is, how do cosmos affect the interactions on Earth and the different planets? Oh, can you repeat that? Sorry. How do cosmos affect the interactions on Earth and the different planets? So, um, so yeah, there's a lot going on. <laughs> there, <laughs> so, there's, um, I mean, there's so many things we have to consider when we study planets. You know, and so many things we have to take into account. That's why it takes a million years of schooling, it feels like, <laughs> to understand a lot of this. Um, but, you know, I think we have to wait and see all the different planets we're going to study. Um, just we, we need to be able to find even more than we have now to compare everything and, and explore all the interactions that can happen. Um, it's there, there's a lot that goes into it so <laughs> I, I don't really have a better answer for you right now <laughs> but i think stay tuned is is the end um, result that you know tests will, will find even more planets so we can study and all the different interactions between the stars between the planets themselves between everything and um, magnetic fields like solar flares like everything there's all kinds of things that we'll study um especially coming up, I think, after test launches. So, you know, 2019, I'd say stay tuned for a lot of good science. All right. Well, Nicole, thank you so much for hanging out with us during Space Week. Um, it's really important to be able to talk to someone who is working on searching for exoplanets because it is such an exciting field where um, you're guaranteed 
job security. There's a lot of planets still left to be found. So yeah, if anybody's thinking about searching for planets and, and potentially other life, that's a pretty cool field. So thanks for hanging out with the students today. And students, your questions as per usual were great. Um, I hope you join us throughout the rest of the week. We're talking to so many different people uh, in the field of space exploration and so many really cool projects all over our solar system and beyond. Um, so we hope to see you guys a lot more. Everything will be on YouTube as well. So again, Nicole, thanks so much. Yeah, thank you so much. It was great talking to you all. I hope you had a good day. <laughs> all right, let me turn the microphones on so the classrooms can say goodbye and thank you. Okay. All right. Well, boys and girls, you were awesome as per usual. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, great question. Enjoy the rest of your day. And Nicole, hopefully we'll talk again soon. And thanks so much for being with us today. Yeah, thank you for having me. All right. All right. Signing off for now. All right. Great.